So hello and welcome to this week's episode on Amplify where I'm in conversation with Harish Hande, the founder and CEO of Telco Foundation, an open source and not-for-profit trust in Bangalore that seeks to inspire and implement socially, financially and inclusive solutions by improving access to sustainable energy. They design decentralized replicable models for global clean access to energy, keeping underserved communities as their central focus. And I'm so excited to have you here, Harish, and learn more about the energy landscape of India and how we can design just and decentralized energy systems. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjeev. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Um, so can we just start off, Harish, by you talking about where your inspiration for Selco came from and, and how you decided that you wanted to focus on this area? I don't know whether I call it an inspiration, but I guess uh, um, uh, it, it was um, you like an uh, as like an any youngster, you're very confused, uh, but uh, wanted to do something um, that you had to spend your time on, I guess. And then I I did a bit of traveling um, in Dominican Republic and. Uh, and uh, was getting um, always uh, uh, questioning what is the what is the primary uh, use of any any um, degree that you have right and um, and then in dominican republic um, i met a farmer who was using solar and uh, that uh, that basically meant uh, and he was paying for it and that was in in 1991 and and, and that actually led to me uh, coming back to uh, India and Sri Lanka to basically look at what can be done um, using solar as a as a future and also as a very important linkage to to uh, income generation and 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 poverty and that's how it started I mean it was not like uh, a, every day passed by and then you start suddenly realizing that uh, 25 years have passed so it, it's nothing it was it was it was more of uh, chance and it was more of uh, that I didn't want to leave it and uh, and I think my primary inspiration all comes from the street vendors and the local farmers who and that's when we started Sanjeev exactly if you and me did a PhD on sugarcane we all be called be experts on sugarcane a farmer doing 45 years of sugarcane will never be called an expert because he yeah. or she does not have a PhD so these titles and all are man-made titles uh, just to create a s separate hierarchy of education racism. And I think, uh, uh, and that, that for me, the inspiration comes from people who actually do hands-on work uh, and uh, don't glorify themselves. Yeah, and I think that's great because you have actually managed to build Selco and work in an energy landscape which is always seen as top down, is always seen as governments and institutions are going to enact a clean energy plan that will get implemented in 10 years time or 20 years time. But you're actually taking a very grassroots perspective on it. So it's see the question, even if it's government, so okay, the question today is like, it is always the educated English speaking, speaking class or people will do be the saviors of the poor. And that type of classist racism or, or, or classism in mm. many ways, right? We are going, so we have replaced the British colonization with the people who can do PowerPoint, Excel and Word. Mm. And I think this, that's, that's one of the uh, criticisms I have of our, it's like even if today, oh, you have returned from the US and you are mm. an IT graduate. What does it, I mean, in the sense that I went to IIT because 300 million Indians did not write the exam. If they had mm. written the exam, I would not have gone into IIT. Mm. So this whole caste, uh, uh, separatism, look, I'm better than somebody else. I think that, and and and, <clears throat> and especially when you look at solar and the poor, it's unless we do not create systems that help, I mean, that creates them to create a company or an organization, we are not going to succeed truly to create an inclusive uh, society. Yeah, and do you think that like, is this the reason why there sort of exists this trade-off between development and climate change? Because I think in India, there exists this attitude of, you know, if you grow now or you develop now, and then we can clean up later and we can figure out where, why air pollution or water pollution are all of these concerns. Because for some reason, just development does not feature. And because development is so closely linked to economic growth, it just does not feature 
um, climate action. It does not feature an environmental aspect. Yes, I mean, that's the sad part because uh, development is very interlinked to climate. Uh, and, and India is in a right position to actually prove, prove it uh, and, and, and be a leader, not only to the other parts in Africa, but also to the Europeans and Americans that the type of development that you did was wrong. Uh, we will not follow it. We have 600 million poor people. I think what's happening in India is, is we are, in some parts of India, I'm not telling you, some parts of India are unfortunately following the Western part of, I mean, in terms of, of development, of consumption. Uh, while we need to relook at what, what are the solutions can we do for the 3 billion people in the world, in, in, in Africa, in Latin America, and Southeast Asia, where development and climate change solutions are extremely interlinked. We do not have to rework the path later on. It's like you are creating a sustainable society right now. And that's where India has a wonderful chance to do that. And can you talk a bit more about how Selco does this at a grassroots perspective, like all the different programs that you have and all the, the different sort of vision and missions that you have and how you work to include that in your, uh, at Selco? Selco is extremely a simple structure. There's nothing complex and really we, I mean, a lot of people write that we have very great strategies. We really don't have any great strategies. We are very, uh, what you call it as, uh, most of my colleagues are from the rural areas. Um, mm. and, and, and the best part, the only difference between many of my colleagues own the problem. Mm. The question is a lot of times what happens if we come with a solution and try to fit a problem to it. A lot of my colleagues own the problem because they would have come through that problem one way or the other. Right. And somebody who owns the problem will actually come up with five different types of solutions because he or she actually knows what it means to come up with a solution and also the benefits of a certain solution, not a band-aid uh, as a typically somebody from outside who, who does it. So, um, and so we have, we are around 700 of us and out of 700, I would say 650 of my colleagues uh, would have been a client or can be a client or or know what the problem is firsthand. It's not a second hand. Oh, we got to do survey and find what the problem is. So that's our strategy. See, we completely believe in people. Uh, we don't, I mean, processes and everything else can follow. And so it's, it's a people. And that's all we care about. And a lot of my colleagues, if you see, we've been together for 20 years, 18 years, 25 years. So it's, that's the, that's, uh, that's our only strategy is people. Yeah, and um, when you talk about, and I know that because I've done research on you, that I know that you're from the cold state of Orissa or Odisha. And when we talk about green growth and we talk about you know moving towards renewable uh, resources, for instance, what does phasing coal look like actually to you? Because I mean, we talk about it, but what does it actually look like when an industry such as coal shuts down in a country like India? See, this is, this, is, uh, this is where I differ with a lot of the activists uh, in a sense that, um, oh, we need to shut down, we need to shut down everything. So the question is, and, and we start protesting. My point is, there is, all, there is a certain energy that came in for a certain reason at a certain point of time. And now today, for example, if somebody says, oh, we need to shut down the phone towers because they are run on diesel, I said, your phone will stop working today. The question is, where are you parallelly phasing out or creating solutions to phase it out? In certain conditions, it cannot be done within a span of one year. Something's two years, something's five years, and something practically in 10 years. So let us, anything that you do, for example, just because computers came in, there should be no typewriters. Is that what, where do we do? Then what happens is many of the poor people who are working in front of the lawyer's office will suddenly be out of doing anything in front. So, so the question is, how do we phase it? How do we see the ecosystem that needs to be developed for solar or anything else today? Even if I put solar everywhere, for example, oh, we need to have solar. The supply chains in the rural areas are missing. Appropriate financing that is required for the poor to buy is actually missing. So suddenly what you're going to have is suddenly a phase out with absolutely no uh, other interlinkages. So if you really want to strengthen and say that renewable energies like solar and wind and, and biogas are going to make a mark is we need to parallelly incentivize financial institutions in the rural areas 
we need to come up with appropriate products that will link to solar like a good dc powered seeing machine so for me a phase out in many ways is two things one is what, what is my next generation of technologies coming up or livelihood applications okay the next five to eight years can they immediately start working on renewable energy that is number one what can we do today uh, that can be immediately uh, replaced and what are things that cannot be replaced and will go on for the next generation what are the options that we, what, what is the time period so today one year next five years and eight, ten, eight to ten years for me that is what i mean by phasing out rather than saying that okay let's stop it from today so. right and i think that's a valid point and so just moving on a little bit to environmental governance and uh, policy essentially you've been working on a ground level for a really long time now and how do you think um, you know, are institutions fair when it comes to ensuring compliance or making sure that environmental regulations, for instance, in the case of EIA draft, EIA 2020, are not diluted? See, I think if more, what I believe it is a lot of times what happens with, there are good intentioned people everywhere. But the problem with a lot of the good, in, and especially, uh, let me talk about the think tanks who, 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 who talk about, okay, let's do this policy, let's look at, uh, let's look at, and this is how the environmental policy should look at. Unfortunately, a lot happens, what happens is that many of the people in these think tanks have absolutely no ground, grass, ground, ground reality. Uh, and if many, like for example, Sanji, how many think tanks that you, uh, you have read, or you know, or you have heard about, who are non-English speaking think tanks? Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> That's the unfortunate part, right? That does it mean that 600 million people who don't speak speak English have absolutely no, cannot give a, a policy input at all in our country like ours, right? Yeah. And that's one of the biggest criticisms of Hindi journalists or Oriya journalists saying that we are not part of the policy making at all. And they, and if you talk to a Bihari journalist or if you talk to a Oriya journalist or, or a Kannada journalist, they'll exactly tell you what should be the rice farming done? What should be the water applications for millets? What should be the next drip irrigation and, and in the drier parts? What should I do in central Vidarbha during the drought? But none of their thinking comes into the think tank and policy. Unless we relook at not only organization like ours to be grassroots, but how do you also create think tanks that are grassroots? Like, see the policy making, what you said, the environmental that should start with what is my environmental policy at the block at the taluk level at the block level at the panchayat level at the at the district level then at the state level and then at the federal level right but we suddenly come from the federal level and say i'm not so but the policy for manipur is going to be very different to karnataka very different to orissa can we do grassroots level policy implementation rather than a central? And that's where the environment will actually succeed because, and that too, India has a great advantage because the policy in Manipur is going to be very different to Karnataka, very different to Kashmir, to Gujarat. Mm. Manipur, you can replicate in Tanzania and in Brazil. Maharashtra, you can replicate in Philippines and Indonesia. And Odisha, you can do it in Togo and Mali. So India becomes an R&D hub for the rest of the world. Mm. In terms of, because of the sector, um, you need drought areas, which is, Egypt is facing rice and drought, you have central Vidarbha. You have plains and floods and cyclones, floods, Assam and Philippines. You have uh, tribal areas of Mali, you take what is happening in the rural tribal areas of Odisha. I think that's where we need to look at, invert the model, not the Delhi-centric model, but look at the Taluk level model and say that, how do we look at environment policies from that and then you'll see a very strong uh, civil society as well as a very strong environmental solutions that you don't even have to talk about okay this is a climate change or not because your all your solutions are by the way climate friendly in the first place not as an added bonus do you have a specific example of for instance when you went in when you just started selco right and you were perhaps not as ground up in your approach as you are now do you have any do you have an example of when you went in and you were just like let's do it like this and then you came out completely like oh my god i've, I've been looking at it the wrong way and i've got the perspective the wrong way around and now i have sort of a better idea of where to head with selco 
Anji, I still have perspective the wrong way. The question is, <coughs> is, is, is because the biases are there. I mean, the biases are unfortunately, I mean, uh, and, and it's not the mistakes that, that fortunately what happened was a lot of my colleagues would take a decision and that's something that I would not take a decision until my colleagues take a decision because they are there. But there are other things that I would learn, which uh, like, for example, in one of the exhibitions way back in 96. So because I had no money, so I would do these exhibitions myself. Um, exhibition is like you put up a tent, you put up three or four solar stuff or solar TV, et cetera, et cetera. And then, and showcase in the village. And there would be in one, there were 600 other stalls. So in the night, a lot of people would, uh, what would happen there, the labor, whatever, the night guy, the labor guys would sleep, right? To watch the, so I had no, nothing, no, I would sleep in it. So suddenly I became friends to a lot of the other people who were sleeping around, right? In a sense, who were night. And they were this, the poor. So these other laborers thought I was another laborer, right? Because I was yeah. sleeping there and blah, et cetera. The final day, what happened? Two crew of my uh, friends from the US came to see uh, their stall. And then after they left, suddenly the 17, these guys came and said, how do you know those uh, guys? I said, no, the, I know them, they were friends. How do you know them? How are friends? So, so, and then they said, so, you, so you're educated. And so within five seconds, I lost 17 friends. Hmm. They all apologized. I'm so sorry. We behaved like, what difference was it? I mean, in five seconds, just because I, so suddenly you realize that your education was a huge, huge barrier and a huge barrier. And that's when it took me time to shed off all the degrees that I have, uh, whether it's masters, PA, who, I mean, I mean, those guys were extremists who taught me what it was in many, in the 17 days I'd learned whatever I couldn't have learned in masters in any manner. What, I mean, my question is, so, so those are things that you start unlearning and, and how do you challenge yourself that in a bus, can you sit and nobody should realize, should know that you have a PhD? Or, or a, why should an auto rickshaw driver say you're a sir? The moment he or she calls you sir, that means there's a barrier. There's a gap between you and him. Yeah. And that for me was, how do you break that? How do you reach to their level? Yeah. Uh, and, that, that, and that for me, I mean, that haven't. I mean, uh, the classically when, I don't know whether Sanchi, you know, Ila Ben. Um, Ila Ben Bhatt is the head of uh, Seva. Right. Uh, the self employed yeah. the iconic Seva, right? She is yes. uh, the iconic, um, um, so uh, whatever so person in the world. She said, Harish Bhai, after 60 years of work, 60, she, six, six decades of work, she told me, I once asked the women, do you think I'm one of you? And, and she, and she was told no, because the way, the way, the type, the way, the, the way you wear your chappal is very different that you're not one of us. <laughs> if Ila Ben after six decades yeah. is not able to herself to be one of them I mean we are very very far away yeah and I think it's also interesting how in India that it keeps getting reinforced right it doesn't just go away if you tell someone if you tell the auto driver person to be like hey don't call me sir that doesn't it doesn't go out you can try all you want but just because right. of the way in which the systems are constructed you can't exactly. actually like just by like having a show of camaraderie, you cannot get exactly. away with the difference that is like keeps replicating itself. Absolutely. And people like to have that, right? And that's the problem. I mean, we all want our kids, our maidservants kid to be our kids maidservant. And, and, and we want that to happen because we live on the poor people to subsidize our living. And so, and that is enforced in, in many ways. And so, yes. And can you explain a little bit um, for people who may not understand just what decentralized energy systems mean? Like how are currently um, energy systems designed and, and how is decentralized energy systems different? See, the question is today, the way it's designed is when you build up a house or, or a factory, uh, you assume that somebody is going to supply you a certain service, that's electricity, and uh, you, are, you are not generating it. You are you're believing that it's going to be generated some far, 100,000 and, 100, kilometers, just like water supply. Uh, you, uh, when you build up a house, your water supply comes, uh, you have 24-7 water, you have 24-7 electricity, but water is somewhere cleaned up thousands of kilometers, just like electricity has been produced thousands of kilometers, and then you pay for the delta units that you supply your delta water, uh, liters of water that you use. Think of that way as if you have a house where you generate your own clean water. 
and and you're not dependent on anybody else or you you produce your own water just like that i mean and so it doesn't matter where you live uh, you're not bothered about whether do i have a water supply or not same same thing the beauty of in energy you can actually do that that you can build your own house and you can build your own uh, a factory and start generating your own electricity where just like as you as you buy buy um, uh, your own production unit mm. you, you produce your own power and you have solar panels on top and today i need say 10 units of electricity i i buy 10 solar panels to buy tomorrow i increase it to 12 units i buy two more panels so it's like when you're building a house solar panel becomes part of your house itself you're not bothered about um where is it coming from and are you going to pay and that that is what we call it as decentralized electricity that um, you are your own producer and you're not dependent on on anybody else and, and it's an asset and that is what we believe as dre where uh, where you customize it you're not uh, and you're not overproducing as a nation or not are you under producing or are you also inclusive because just because you're living in a remote area or you're poor you need to pay much more because uh, we all have to pay a centralized electricity a decentralized makes the society more inclusive uh, makes the poor also doesn't i am living off an island or i am living in a slum i can generate more more electricity i don't need to be dependent on anybody else and that's what dre is it's 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 it democratizes um the utilization of energy and have you experienced any i'm sure you have so if you could just talk about the kind of challenges that you experienced when you wanted to sort of um, replicate this even within india see that the, the, yeah the, when we we have an incubation center which actually uh, want uh, look at replication in other parts of india and for for us as i said ranchit uh, sanchit to start with was people are very very critical for us it's a, uh, it's nothing uh, we don't believe in process or institutionalization process has to follow not the be oh you got to institutionalize it if if that was so good do we then really care whether donald trump is the president or joe biden is the president why are we so cared about it i mean if institutions were so strong uh, no it is it the people so when we go to other places the biggest challenge sanjay faced was that the the doors that open for me because quote on quote i am from iit is ridiculous and the other guys who are 100 times more motivated 1000 times much better than me in the rural areas will never be able to open the doors that i can just because i have a chappa behind me <laughs> and that is a scary thought process so it all depends on when you speak to you how you dress where you come from which background what your linkedin or resume is bull i think and that is the biggest challenge and that's when we said um, we created our own incubation center and we created our own fund because uh, to invest into such brilliant entrepreneurs oh, where do they graduate from which i am degree do they have okay let me invest my question is an i am degree guy will if i look at an i am degree i will never invest because the guy has no clue about about a bihari rice paddy farmer versus a manipuri uh, farmer and but we are in that that is for me the biggest barrier for the middle class and upper middle class funding resources that did not respect or trust many of the rural entrepreneurs in other parts of the country and that for me was the biggest uh, i guess the barrier or challenge that still exists yeah. still exists and can you talk a little bit more about how the work that you're doing with dre intersects with other issues that india um, is facing such as water scarcity or food insecurity or at the moment pandemic which i understand is a is a big question but if you could just talk about how all of these different issues interconnect um, and explain that a little bit that would be great see uh, see the issue is today uh, when you look at um, drought areas uh, let's reverse the problem what does a drought mean It means less water right or no water okay yeah. okay now we have to, we have to grow so what happens is any a time when we have a drought we relook at okay how how do we get water for sugarcane but we are not even questioning do we need sugarcane in the first place 
uh, what are the type of crops that would grow in such ar arid areas and the world has proven in in egypt or in 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 other parts of rajasthan okay how do i do millets how okay for millets to be growing how do i look at now uh, drip irrigation okay now i have drip irrigation great so how much water is needed okay great okay for solar water pump okay solar water pump what should i do okay can i pump up the water to a storage tank in the daytime and do drip irrigation during the night time so that i can save on evaporation by 40% these are solutions that we need to come up with so question oh i have floods in assam what type of houses that i need to be built so that the poor don't spend again money on rebuilding their houses every year can it be flood resistance can it be on stilts can it be sustainable etc right the issue is that's where the the see solar it's not unfortunately in our sector sanji on environmental sector we we concentrate on solar panels and solar batteries we don't concentrate on the solutions what does it is it better health better livelihoods better education remote education can i actually look at and then use solar as part as a part of the solution by the way it's run on solar hmm. so democratization of it and the same way in pandemic what has pandemic led to is destruction of centralization of systems the transportation systems the market linkages for the poor to actually sell the product. the beauty of dre is the pandemic has actually shown that you can create 100 kilometers of bubble 200 kilometers of bubble grow yourself sell vegetables in the local areas how can i come up with solar powered cold storage for small and medium scale farmers to store their vegetables that can be sold within 100 to 50 kilometers right pandemic actually has shown that dre is a much more uh, friendlier stable ecosystem that leads to resilience for the farmers to have their livelihoods and that is where the linkage between uh, uh, dre pandemic and other necessities that are actually shown so pandemic has been a, is a, is a is a trailer for the larger crisis the climate yeah and do you think that because of the pandemic there will perhaps be a refocus or like a re uh, prioritization of the way in which we're doing things i hope so i hope so and i hope i hope uh, the not see more than the policy when we talk about policy and the government it also depends on all those are citizens of the country right hopefully the middle class and upper middle class realize that and they realize that it's 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 a work from home when people say i said whoever is working from home is luxurious because are you going to tell all the farmers in our countries to work from home you will not have food to uh, eat on uh, the next right. day and i think as long as the middle class and upper middle class in our country realizes well, how to actually make an inclusive system that's when the change happens it's i i, I somehow believe that i, I really ha i was i mean i'm i'm 50 50 there sanji in the sense that the lot of the youngsters are realizing it which is great but uh, the people who are working from home as a luxury they are not but hopefully the youngsters i have a lot of hope on there with with ages between 18, 18 to 23 24 25 i think that that uh, class of youngsters are giving me a lot of hope yeah and it's interesting because a lot of the conversation um that i mean i do fall into that age bracket so i will consider myself <laughs> in that uh, in that generation hopefully giving you some hope so a lot of the conversation that like i have had with some of my friends who are also working in a similar space is that just how much of an emphasis there is on individual action and on individual behavior as opposed to holding governments and institutions accountable and, and what are your thoughts on that because on one hand i imagine when we talk about renewable energy there might be some convincing to do or there might be not necessarily at a grassroots level but i mean i don't know you know but like is there must be some convincing to do but then also the larger thing is that you should be able to hold systems to account so what are your thoughts on like building accountability and and sort of striking that balance i mean let's see that accountability i've had a issue I have see you know again the government is made of people okay and and you have is officers you have bureaucracy or everything else and and everywhere everywhere just like in your home or your society or your building there are people who are going to be your champions and people who are going to be cynics 
it's our prerogative to go and get a champion so every time i met a good is officer or director he says harish the simple thing is that i'm here for 2 years all the time people come and tell me their problems okay now you are on the field how every time people will come oh, you solve it the water is leaking nobody comes up with two to three solutions boss i have three solutions i have experiment can you replicate and scale up they all expect me to come up with solutions right but a normal citizen who is complaining every time does not come up with a solution now if if lot of the youngsters and middle class start creating lot of the solutions suddenly the government is going to change because see that's why a lot of the youngsters when they come and complain on my desk here i said was give me five solution i will take it to the is officer i will take it to the head of the bangalore municipal municipal commissioner all to the ips officer five out of 10 people will listen to me let us not look at the other five who let us look at the five who listen and there are always champions in the government just like champions in your house champions in your society what we always give an excuse that how the these guys are not listening to but if and if i if i turn around tell me how many of us have actually created solutions for the government to follow i mean if you look at america europe especially america which is a uh, which is a innovative um, country forget what's happened in the last four term years nobody is going to complain say that guy didn't did he didn't do it let me first solve it and start doing it right in our country first is we complain <laughs> yeah right and then i had a, for example i had a youngster who wanted to join such just like similar to your age 5 7 years ago immediately the parents came in after a week uh he's joining selco uh, a social enterprise he has to get married sir you know that right so he will not get a wife he is in selco i didn't know the connection between uh so and then i asked him just i diverted and said sir how was the roads and you oh okay. i said exactly you want gandhi to be born in the neighbor's house not your house you don't <laughs> want your son to solve the problem yeah. you want others to solve but i will complain <laughs> i don't want to risk it and i think that's why i keep telling to the parents you are the problem the problem is you don't want to solve it or you don't want your son or daughter to be the solver yeah because cousin is in infosys i want him or her yes. to want more than my cousin yes. i think this is like every like a uh, ghar ghar ki kahani and like this is right. the entire reason is like oh you're going to go to university what are you going to study are you going to be right. gainfully employed for right. uh, you know the big four which is deloitte or something or or like a bank or whatever and then are you eventually going to move abroad <laughs> and stay put <laughs> I exactly i mean that's i know my question when people say i i, I mean yeah and when people say oh my son is uh, joining mckenzie and all oh i said why didn't he take a tougher path the easiest thing is to join mckenzie and all yes. i mean come on what's the big deal you want to go and do graphs that nobody will read in your life is that what you want to do <laughs> right <clears throat> or you want to write a great paper that nobody will read <clears throat> absolutely yes. nobody and it has not a single <coughs> piece of line is practical right so what's and then you say i am in mckenzie i am in deloitte i mean i think that's that's the easiest way out and for the middle class and upper middle class families we all want to take the easiest way out and our comparison is also very small la mera cousin sana family or my friends we we our bar is so low no uh, what yeah. my daughter wants to do or son is like no bar is like what do you want to change no 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 that's how that's uh, my bar yeah. is very very low Yeah, there's a meme, right? Uh, Sharma ji ka beta, who's like always right. doing everything. So I said the bar is Sharma ji ka beta. Right. <laughs> so if he's getting married at 25, you have to get married at 25. Right. And, and that's also, sad. No, that's very sad. I mean, that's exactly why I always tell the parents: is boss, why are you killing the potential potential of the youngsters? They all uh, they can vote. They vote for the government. They can't decide for the future. Give me a break. Right. Yeah. Uh, and also i mean i wonder if this this sort of reluctance i mean there's loads of reasons why this like parents and society is generally reluctant uh, when it comes to people working in social entrepreneurship and that's usually because it's like seen as um you know not something that you can sustain yourself doing long term and when for instance if we move that conversation just a little bit to like the financial um input or the financial help that social enterprises get or the investments that they get 
you know, how can we actually change the landscape on that? How can we change people's perspective on what they value as worthy enough of their investment? Because it's like everything that if you're building an app, it's considered, you know, a great investment. But if you're doing something that perhaps people don't immediately understand at a grassroots level, it's like, mm, you're a social enterprise. So that's why, I mean, I, we, uh, Sanjay, we don't consider ourselves as a social enterprise. We are social, we are an enterprise. The others are anti-social enterprises. Uh, why should I be a social? I'm, I'm rectifying whatever you guys did. I mean, the other people did as a harm, right? You're all right. anti-social. Uh, and that's exactly, we are trying to rectify what everybody else did. And, and why can't we be inclusive? Why can't the, the maidservant's son become a doctor? And we are saying that we are creating a platform where the maidservant's son can be a great. And that's our large scale so-called app, uh, whatever, however you define undefined app of inclusiveness where the, 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 the he can or she can become a doctor. Yes, it's a long term and we, and we are not doing a bandaid. What we are trying to do is repair the fracture. And repairing a fracture takes time, and 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 uh, and that's what we push people saying saying that you want to solve, or you want to take the easy route. What do you want to do? So if the society wants to take an easy route, great. That's where you are, and that's your bar, fine. And that's when the, the our selection procedure is also not on LinkedIn or on resumes. It's like, do you have the passion? I don't care whether you're for one first grade dropout, a kindergarten dropout, or your PhD from MIT. I don't care. Are you, do you have the ability to solve a problem? Can you run a street vendor's job for two days for me? I don't care whether you're from MIT, run, run that tomato vendor shop around this city for two days and then tell me you can do it. And, and if you can't do it, then boss, oh, MIT degree, wapas kar do. Yeah, MIT degree, wapas kar do. That means you can't, you can't even do a simple, because you thought it was simple, right? I did not say it's simple. You thought it was simple. So my question for me is like, how do you break um, those? And, and, and when people, the social enterprise, because in our culture, and she's like, social work should be done after you retire. I don't know what that social work you want to. And like uh, the best statement I found once was Indra Nui, uh, head of Pepsi, who said, uh, now I want to do something meaningful with my life. I said, what did you do then for the last 30 years, boss? <laughs> That is amazing. Yeah. That yeah. Now I want to do something meaningful. Huh. I mean, this is where people lose out. I mean, couldn't you have done meaningful when you were 18 and start keep doing one? And I, in the enterprises that we run, we have 600 people. Nobody is starving. Everybody is happy. And yeah. I eat different food every day, boss. I eat food from North Karnataka to South Karnataka. I get the best cuisine. I, I eat recipes that are no longer uh, available in the world. I have a... Uh, just two years last year, I had a uh, I went to a, uh, a rural place where they cooked 52 recipes that don't no longer exist. Yeah. Um, right. I mean, where else can I actually have this luxury uh, at all ever in my life? So, I think people miss out uh, completely um, rather than uh, complaining how my second maid servant didn't come today because I <laughs> <laughs> I think that's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. And when we talk about you know uh, building just energy systems or building an environmentally just future you know, what, what does that look like for you i mean are we on track for that at the moment because again a lot of the policy discourse talks about decarbonization and is that enough is that enough to build an environmentally just future which again is a big jargon term See, we, a lot of people are solely concentrating on the energy side of it, right? In a sense, rather than what it should do. My question is, sometimes we, uh, oh, we need X amount of electricity to be generated. My question is why? Why do you need that in the first place? Why are we not, re like, for example, I, we are rented in a sad, sad place where I'm using light during daytime when the sun is shining so brightly outside, Right. So my question is, how can the building designs, the design of health services, right? We, oh, we need to create hospitals. Great. Why do we need to create hospitals? So you're assuming that people are unhealthy without even looking at what should I create in a manner that people don't need to go to the hospital, right? Rather than saying that we need to create X number of hospitals, right? Or when people say, oh, X number of people are without electricity, so poor, are so many poor people. 
So 150 years ago, the whole world was very poor because there's no, there was no electricity in the first place, right? So there were, were there no rich people during that time? So my question is, our parameters of thinking have changed Sanji, in the sense that, so it's not about decarbonization. If, my question is, why do you need energy at all in the first place? And can we define that energy in a sustainable manner? Do I need it for a remote school? Okay, how do I do it? Do I need it from a slum area? Do I need it for a hospital here? Okay, if I need it for a hospital, how is the building design, number one? Is the X-ray machine the most efficient X-ray machine? Are the baby warmers the more efficient so they don't need to guzzle more electricity? Are they designed in a just like a pottery maker's house, right? A pottery maker's house, is it designed in a way that daylighting is there? It doesn't need light during the daytime. How do I redesign the, the, the concept of good building design, materials, finance, utilization, market linkage, and then solar power? Together makes a solution, not... So today what happens is we, we only solely define solar panels and say, I'm using solar. Just because Anji, you might have 150 solar panels on your roof, does it give you the liberty to use 100 air conditioners? Oh, no. I'm using solar. <laughs> yeah. So I'm now free of using anything, right? Yeah. Oh, I'm yeah. using solar water pump. So I can use water the way I want it. Yeah. Well, it's solar, right? But you're, you're actually misutilizing another resource called water. It's the holistic way of thinking that needs to come into our education system or our teaching methodologies. It's not about decarbonization. It's about why should what's the best and the most sustainable manner where it's inclusive, where you're not only harming the environment, but you're also not you're creating a level playing field for any kid to actually succeed. And that's a just system. Yeah, yeah. And um, do you think that? perhaps overpopulation is a thing because it's it's always said that you know resources can be and especially in the case of india i mean this was certainly a narrative that i was exposed to when i was doing my masters and undergrad in the uk and and it's always a narrative which is sort of by the global north uh, that's sort of propagated which is that um if uh, in countries like india or in china overpopulation wasn't an issue then there would be a more equitable distribution of resources. And so hence it would be more sustainable. And I don't That's personally agree point. with that, but I just want to know what you think. America did not prove that way. US did not prove it because it did. Uh, if you look at the majority of world's uh, carbon, this one is because of the US, which has consumed in a large manner. So they have a 300 million, which was three times the size of India, one third the size of India's population equitable distribution did not happen. I mean, the, the disparities in the US are as good as any other country in many ways. So you, some of the European countries were managing, but I, I mean, it's not, yes, we do have an overpopulation. We need to look at overpopulation and, and how do we create a 50 year strategy to do that? But even with the 1.2 billion people that we have, we have enough resources inside the country, whether it's solar, whether it's wind, biogas, and and create these ecosystems of production and productivity within 50 kilometers and 100 kilometers and 200 kilometers radius and start looking at those templates of the taluk block level, taluk level, district level, we should be able to do it even with that 1.2 billion people. And, and that I think is not, an, not while we, we have to look at our 2050 issue where our population growth that we need to stabilize, but better education, better economic uh, opportunities at the local level will lead to a better balance of what we need to happen. And I, I, but that's how do we make our sol solution more grounded? And so the, pop the problem for India is our thinking process of the middle class and upper middle class that we have repeat the, re replaced the British colonialism with our middle class colonialism. And that is uh, more uh, dangerous, I would say, uh, which does not think inclusively. She just so much, but Pani Puri aap jake 250 rupees mein khaoge. Then you will not even talk about it. See, our thinking, Sanchi, is like a street vendor, if you vegetable prices, you are cheating. Kyu kar rahe ho? Right. But you go to Big Bazaar and say, oh, it's very expensive. Mm -hmm. Expensive use. Karte. 
Yeah, and my final question to you then um, for today would be how it is that you sort of move past the the sort of dichotomy that exists around like development and climate action and you actually see sustainable development or um, you know the DRE systems as working in tandem with other goals of economic growth. See, if you look at uh, Selco, both Selco Foundation and Selco, we, we do not, except me, uh, uh, who comes from the so-called energy background, and I hardly use, we have nobody else from the energy background. We have zero people from the energy background. We have anthropologists, people who are, uh, we have designers, um, we have building design, architect colleagues of mine, we have doctors, uh, we have uh, product design, uh, we have anthropologists who have worked on monkeys, uh, and chimpanzees, um, and and we have uh, my all my grassroots level uh, our colleagues who are now CEO of Selcoe, all are absolutely zero, zero energy background. So everybody started looking at it's not about a solar power, but what does the health center actually need for better uh, so that premature babies are taken care of. Okay, what type of content is needed for a remote school in Manipur versus Karnataka, right? Now, when we provide a solar powered sewing machine to person in Gulbarga, does he or she have the market linkage to sell the extra shirts or not, right? So it starts becoming, how do I look at income? Solar become by the way, right. not as the centerpiece of our solution. So for us, it's all about rice mills and blacksmith blowers or the silk weavers to roti rolling machine. Solar is, yeah, we, that's how it's powered. So it's, it's the end goal is livelihoods, health, building design, uh, and all that. It's, it's an ed better education. How, how, do I look, how do we look at better opportunities for the physically challenged, for example, or, or the blind? What type of, uh, how, how can SDG 7 link up to disabilities? Or I have a disaster, whether it's a drought or an earthquake, how do I look at solar energy as an interlink to the solution? per se. So that's what we concentrate on, Sanjay. Yeah. And um, thank you so much for this episode today, Harish. I really enjoyed myself. Definitely one of the most fun conversations I've had early, early in the morning. Uh, and I really appreciate uh, you taking time out for this. Uh, I know that you're a very busy person. I can hear all your notifications going off. So I really do appreciate you being here. the end of this week's episode thank you so much for tuning in you can find all the relevant links and handles to know more about our guest this week in the episode description if you have any feedback suggestions requests or simply just want to get in touch with us then please do head over to our podcast website we are available to flag and say hi to via facebook instagram or email thank you and see you next week